What is all this? This is a lot of pages. Is this what he wrote? Yes, you should read it, but maybe start at the end, then circle back. First, though, I think you better sit down. This is how Ian Reid ends his novel, and this is where we are going to start. Hey everyone, I'm Mariana, this is Impression Blend, and today we are once again talking about I'm Thinking of Ending Things, though this time around we are diving deep into spoilers and what it all means. If you accidentally stumbled upon this video and what you're looking for is a spoiler-free review, I will leave a link below for you to my first review of this film where I keep things very vague. But for the rest of us, let's discuss. So what exactly happened in I'm Thinking of Ending Things? Here is my quick take considering the ending. An old man who is a custodian at a high school is filled with feelings of loneliness, hopelessness, and regret. As he thinks about whether there is even a point in going on living, he plays out a scenario in his head from the perspective of a woman he wishes he dated. When watching this film, of course, we don't know this from the very beginning. Beginning. We see a young woman getting in the car to go on a road trip with her boyfriend Jake as she thinks about ending the relationship. While this storyline is unfolding, the film keeps cutting to shots of an old custodian who we later realize is Jake. Almost everything we see in this film is happening in Jake's head. It's not exactly a memory, it's a dreamlike speculation based on real-life people and fragments of old memories for him. As he gets more and more lost in his thoughts, the scenarios get weirder, whether it's him thinking about his parents getting older in the span of a single visit, or the Tulsi Town ice cream sequence, or the entire ending. And let's talk about the ending, because on first viewing, I thought it was very vague, especially compared to the book, where things are resolved in a very specific way. In Ian Reid's novel, the story is intercut with brief sections of dialogue where people are discussing a man who just killed himself. At the end, we actually get the man's perspective and what leads to his decision decision, we find out definitively that he never gave the girl his number and they never talked again. We fully realize the extent of his loneliness as well as realize he actually is a physicist who couldn't deal with the working environment. This is something that is briefly mentioned in the film as well. We hear that the girlfriend is the one who is studying physics and later we hear that she is working in physics, but in the end, it's the animated pig that tells us the truth. Jake is the physicist. The film does not show his suicide in the graphic way the book describes it, However, the fact remains, the title of I'm Thinking of Ending Things is not only referring to the fictional relationship we see unfold on screen, but it also refers to Jake considering something a lot darker. Does he die in the end? Yes, he does. We see that final shot of the old man's car completely covered in snow in the morning. But did he freeze to death on purpose? After my second viewing, I believe he did. We see him set the keys down on the seat next to him instead of starting the car. We see him frantically undress himself, which is in line with paradoxical undressing that can happen when a person is experiencing severe hypothermia. Another common effect of severe hypothermia, hallucinations. While it's easy to see the majority of this film as a trip down memory lane at first glance, I have to strongly disagree with that interpretation. Even setting the book aside, which clearly states what's real and what isn't, there are so many indicators throughout the film that hint at the relationship not being a real thing if you take a closer look at the details. First, the girlfriend's name. She doesn't actually have one. She is Lucy, Louisa, Lucia. We never find out who she actually is. What's interesting is that the calls she getting are from these same names as well. It's her 
calling herself. And by her, I mean it's old Jake's subconsciousness showing through. Remember the voicemails she gets? When we hear who is talking, it's an old man's voice, not a woman's, and the messages keep referring to some important question. What is that question? We don't exactly know, but the book does. So we come back to the decision, the question. It's the same one. In the end, it's up to us all. What do we decide to do? Continue or not? Go on or? As we already know, Jake is thinking about ending things and that is the question of the caller. Second, the girlfriend's work. There is a variety of things she does. She's a poet, she's a physicist, she's a waitress, she's studying gerontology, which by no coincidence is the scientific study of aging. She's an artist, she's writing a paper on rabies. Jake simply doesn't know because these interactions never happened. Remember when he refers to William Wordsworth, the English romantic poet who wrote a series of poems that examine his unrequited love for Lucy, a beautiful, idealized woman. That is who the girlfriend is here. Jake projects his ideas about women and relationships, heavily influenced by the arts and entertainment, onto this woman he has only met once. At the end of the film, she even describes meeting Jake as one of the thousands of non-interactions of of her life. What's also significant is that everything she does or says is later revealed to be somebody else's work. That poem she recites that she supposedly wrote, we later see it in a book titled Rotten Perfect Mouth by Eva HD in Jake's childhood room. Her painting she shows to Jake's parents, we later see a print of it in Jake's basement. It's by Ralph Albert Blakerock, who was a romanticist American painter. Her thoughts on the woman under the influence? She's quoting Pauline Kael's review of the film. Her and Jake finish each other's sentences, he seems to hear her thoughts, and she has a cell phone at the time when Jake is a young man, which should be way before the invention of cell phones if we take old man Jake time as present day. Actually, the entire film has this dreamy, timeless quality to it. You can't really put a finger on when in time this is even happening. Third, he can't even decide what she looked like. If you're paying attention, you'll notice her appearance is changing constantly. The colors of her clothing, the patterns, the layers, the jewelry, hairstyles. According to the film's costume designer, Melissa Toth, the young woman wore five or six iterations of the same dress, six different colors of coats of the same style, as well as various colors of the same sweater. She is even played by a different actress for a moment as they're driving in the car. All of this adds to this unease you feel while watching the film because while you may not immediately realize the subtle appearance changes, your brain is still registering that something is off. And of course, it slowly introduces you to the idea that what you're seeing is not reality. It's a mess of thoughts mixed with memories in one person's head. What Kaufman accomplished here is brilliant. The novel is very clear on the fact that Jake has schizophrenia. There are a lot of indicators throughout the story that hint at this, but in the end, when we finally get Jake's real-time perspective, there is no doubt. The heartbreaking final pages merge all of the characters and are filled with loneliness and sadness. The film, though, is not as clear when it comes to this. Some of the indicators made it from book to screen, the others didn't. Perhaps the two biggest ones are Jake's mother describing the ringing in her ears as hearing whispers, and Jake's final speech that quotes John Nash's speech from A Beautiful Mind, a film that heavily focuses on the scientist's struggle with schizophrenia. But here, I am not convinced. Jake's parents are something that actually comes from his memories, and the way his mother is portrayed in every 
every scene she's in makes it seem like whatever was going on with her was pretty consistent. As for the final speech, it falls in line with Kaufman's commentary on how much our perception of reality and people is shaped by the media we consume. That's a theme that is present throughout the entire film. After all, John Nash never actually delivered that speech, and the choice to include Jake thinking of a movie version of a famous scientist instead of a real one is absolutely a deliberate one. As for the whole imaginary scenario thing, that could be open to interpretation. Perhaps, as morbid as this sounds, everything we see in this film is a hallucination Jake is experiencing as he is freezing and dying. But on the other hand, how many of us have played out a situation in our mind where we either said the right thing or did the right thing instead of recalling what actually happened? And how much did those real people we imagined behave the way we wanted them to. Now, this is where the personal views of all of us watching this film become very important because there is enough here thematically for countless think pieces. In the end, the main idea we as viewers walk away with from I'm thinking of ending things is going to be a reflection of our own thoughts, which is perfect because examining our perception of things and the way seeing the world and people in it through someone else's ideas affects us is one of the main themes of the film. Both Kaufman and Reed are interested in exploring the thin line between perception and reality. They want us to think about where imagination meets memory and how much of our worldview is based on what we ourselves project onto other people. We see this in the girlfriend character being a contradictory figure, existing somewhere between Jake's personality and an idealized woman he came up with. It's also clear how much these imaginary conversations are affected by arts and entertainment and how much Jake's ideas about relationships are affected by the way romance is portrayed by other people. At the same time, when we think about what we expect of other people around us, a lot of that comes from what we expect of ourselves. Often our ideas about how a certain situation should unfold or what someone else's reaction to us should be is based on what our experiences and reactions are. We spend this entire film in Jake's head and a lot of what we see truly feels like a stream of consciousness. We could talk for a long time pointing out the details of how often the film references itself, repeated use of actors, same lines delivered by different characters, details of the setting that keep showing up across timelines and locations. Which, by the way, is a big part of what makes I'm Thinking of Ending Things so interesting to rewatch. There's just so much to pick up on on repeat viewings. One of my favorite visual representations of Jake's mind was a look at his room that is filled with references to the rest of the film, but also filled with books and movies. There is a shot where the camera gives us a closer look at some of his DVDs, which among other things, include titles such as Unforgettable Mishaps, Futile Efforts at Success, Abandoned Friendship, The Ways People Are Looked At, Lasting Memories of Sorrow, and Lost Hope. This just further goes to show the blurred lines between personal memories and seeing the world through a cultural prism. This idea of culture shaping our perception and expectations is my biggest takeaway from this film, closely followed by an extensive meditation on loneliness, aging, and the nature of hope. 
But whenever the film is addressing any of these other themes, it's almost always framing them within cultural references, be that literature or art or film or musicals or just generally widely accepted concepts. And believe me, the irony of a film trying to make me think about how culture is shaping my thinking is not lost on me. But when we look at ourselves or at others, do we see people as they truly are? Or are our thoughts a shattered reflection of a perceived reality? So this is my interpretation of the film. Yours could be very different and I would love to know what your main takeaway from I'm Thinking of Ending Things was, especially if you haven't read the book. I am fully aware that reading the book before watching the film and particularly being a big fan of the book has affected my interpretation. So I would love to know what your take on everything is. I know I didn't cover every single thing about this film because honestly you could sit here for hours breaking down every single scene and there would be a ton to talk about but what I wanted to do is kind of talk you through how I saw the film and what my main takeaway was and I hope you guys enjoyed watching that. As always thank you so much for watching this video a special thank you to all of my patrons who are supporting me on Patreon and an extra special thank you to to the patrons whose names are on the screen right now with of course a big thank you to every single person who has finished this video and made it this far if you enjoyed the video which i hope you did please don't forget to give it a thumbs up share it subscribe to my channel if you haven't already follow me on social media all of those links are in the info box below and i hope you're having a wonderful day i will see you very soon in my next video bye